Games, board games, board games. I might be talking about board games, board games, but I'm not gonna shout. I am starting off the streaming with a little bit of singing, and today I'll talk about agency choices and randomness and thinking what might be a suitable blend of these in a game. It's different for each audience, it's never the same. Board games choice and randomness, it's what I'm talking about. Board games choices and randomness, I'm not gonna shout. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good whatever it is, wherever you are. And I am Bez. It is 10 a.m. UK time, which means it's time for Bezzy Beats and Board Game Blether. Today, inspired by a very low, high luck, let's call it low skill, but the number of choices isn't necessarily a determinant of the skill, is it? Or is it? But I, I don't know what my thoughts are upon all this. I just want to... Yeah, have a bit of a bledder, have a bit of a discussion potentially, and talk about, yeah, choices. So, like I say, every game, I think, needs agency. I think that not every game needs choices. I believe that Snakes and Ladders, I believe that, um, I can't think of, War, like the children's game that I've never played, but you... Flip hop cards, and then the person who wins takes the other person's cards. It's just the highest suit. So once you shuffle, there is no more choice. I believe that games like Candyland are still games. I don't believe that choices are a requirement for a game. On the other hand, I don't believe that randomness is essential for a game. I quite like games without randomness sometimes, and I loved playing Chris Bocchi's Think and Write, as I'm going to call it, from Peter, that Peter Hazelwood is publishing, played it like four times on the Saturday, and the fact that there's no randomness, but there's still chaos. And let's talk about the variability, because the chaos doesn't have to be from randomness. The chaos can be from other people making choices, and I sometimes if that's happening at the same time as what we're doing, that can inject more chaos into the game. If there's more players, then there's even more chaos in the game. And there's that adds, I guess, variability. Which variability, I think, is the key thing that you want in a game? Hmm. Maybe that is an essential requirement for a game. Like, variability and agency. I hadn't thought about variability before. Like, in the past, I've been saying that to game needs three things. It needs some degree of agency, which I believe that simply by picking up the dice and having to roll it, and then you move along a number of spaces based on what the dice says, that itself can be a feeling of agency for, and I believe that a game is in the eye of the beholder. I believe that for a child who feels a sense of agency or anyone who feels a sense of agency by rolling a die and moving their thing along, then that's a game. But for someone who doesn't, then it's not a game. And I would say that, um, yeah, variability, that's a really interesting one. So I believe that games are about something that you choose to do. So it can't be forced upon you, obviously, it can't be slavery, it can't, it has to be something that you consciously agree to do so it can't be something that you find yourself accidentally doing there has to be agency but yes i think that variability is the fourth component huh yeah just this like realize that anyway we'll talk about the blend of choice and randomness like i said neither of those are essential to games but 
They are both good things in their own way. And first of all, let's talk about recent highlights, recent highlights, living life and seeing the sights, recent highlights, recent highlights, playing games and other delights. Recent highlights. So what have I been up to recently? What have I been up to yesterday? Mainly just going to a playtest and then having a bit of a snooze. So these photos are by Rob Harris, who organizes the event Playtest UK. It was running again. It was it's every month on Sunday in the Jugged Hair, Vauxhall Bridge Road. Bunch of people go. In January, we had a decent crowd. I'm going to say 10, 12 people, something like that. Yesterday, we had 21 people. That was amazing. So many people coming and I think there were maybe 17, 15, something like that, designers that got their games played. And there were a bunch of people who were designers but just came along just to try stuff. There was a father and son team who the two of them came along and just showed the one game, which is obviously very nice because then everyone else gets two bodies at the table, which really helps. Um, it was just amazing to see the number of people. I mean, just look at that picture. Five tables of people playing games was so just fantastic. Here we've got one of the games. This looks like um, Gavin Birnbaum's game, AU. Gavin was doing a blind test. It's gone along quite far. It's a very serious strategic game where, like QE, there's auctions going on, there's real-time trading, and so if you're like Mike and I, you say, okay, do we do this? Let's do that. And then we both take our things down. And as soon as two people have taken their ships down, that's the end of the trading. And it's about trading within four different types of currency. At the end, all you care about is having the most currency of the currencies that are worth the most. So you want kind of like a dominating share of the currency if it's worth the most. It will, it's a really fascinating game. This is Pearl's game, Cake of Doom, lovely thing. Um, that's me playing with Pearl at the end of the table. And there's Chiron, um, oh, Jeremy, Miriam, myself, a lovely quick take that game. There's Chris. Dean and someone that I've not met. There were so many new faces. And there's Ben who was there for the first time and Simon who was there for the first time that I got to meet. It's always joyful events being at these places and seeing what everybody brings, seeing like the variety of stuff, seeing what's going on and just enjoying everything. And there's Perrin who's a regular at on Friday daytime playtests and there's John who brought this along to a Friday and looks like there's quite a few changes. And there's me again with Chris, Bob and Jeremy playing a game with not a lot of choices going on. Yeah, you can just see a smidgen of the games. That's not all of them. Now, let me talk through all the games that I played yesterday. Firstly, this is Mike. Mike and David Digby are working on a game called Rock Band, obviously the name needs to change, but in this game it's real time, you're playing to the length of a song, and then each player has different instruments with different puzzles going on. One player's doing the keyboard, doing this little puzzle, one person's doing the guitar and sliding things so that everything, all the notes that you need are along a fret, another person's doing the drums and then wants to organise everything with their four limbs and matching their limbs to the order of the notes, another person's doing a spatial linking puzzle with the vocals and another person's doing bass guitar and you can have a team of people and you're all cooperating trying to get the best songs. I always find that great fun to play, I'm always a fan of it. We played that a couple of times, gave some feedback and then played a bit of this game which is a first time out the box. Um, Hot off the printer that morning, cats roaming around, playing cards, spraying the territory, trying to get the most territory. Had a lot of interesting ideas. 
I'm definitely, like all of these games, I'm keen to see how they evolve. This is us playing Cake of Doom. Obviously, this is prototype parts, like ugh, all of these things are subject to change. Never judge one of these games based on the art, but you can get a sense of where the cards are going to be. Like, there's player aids, there's the aliens with the asymmetric powers, you're playing the cut cakes to go on to the to take over the poles and like the Australia or different parts of the world and then once you've bribed parts of the world once you've taken seized control of two large areas then you're going after doom the dangerous order of mankind something like that anyway you've got your cake cards that used to take over things and you've got your um cake of doom like action and sabotage cards which are kind of like the take that when someone tries to take over you smack them and then you say haha it's minus two or whatever and that's an interesting wee thing it definitely felt like a distillation of munchkin it felt like um and hello yoda it is lovely to see you i'm just talking about what i played yesterday and this is definitely a super simple game there are special effects that you get whenever you take over a thing. There's a few little bits of card counting and keeping track of what other people have. But it's basically all about the table talk saying, hey, let's gang up on that person. Ignore me. Gang up on that person. Forget about me. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's the kind of thing that's going to play very differently depending on the player count, depending on the people around the table. And, yeah... I don't think it needs mo any more changes. This is a game that needs zero changes. And before I talk about this one, I am going to briefly mention the game that I play tested. If actually I might um, grab it out of my bag if I can. <laughs> So the game that I play tested yesterday is a game about judging which object best matches three criteria after everyone quickly grabs an object and does a pitch. So you've got three criteria um, in the middle of the table. You've got seven objects. It might be like a fire engine, the sun, street light, bird, steam engine. Pyramids of Giza and a jumper. And then so the judge flips over three of them to say, okay, the criteria this time are you want something smooth, something you saw recently, and fruity. So then everyone, as quickly as they can, grabs one of these objects. So there's nothing really fruity about these, but I might grab um oof. I might grab the sun and say, yeah, the sun's pretty smooth. It's liquid and it's definitely something that I saw recently. I saw it behind the clouds and hey, the sun kind of helps with photosynthesis. It makes our fruits and also it's yellow, which is kind of a fruity color. When you think of yellow, you kind of think of lemons or the sun and they've got that association. And so people have to give their pitch and then a judge decides and that's it. It's a completely, um, it's not a game for people who like to strategize and like to win. It's a game for people who like to grab things quickly and like to smile and like to um, make these decisions and like to be creative and express themselves. So that was that game and I quite... The playtest went well. It felt like everyone had um, a good amount of feedback. Everyone was really positive about it. I wanted to ask everyone what other descriptions would you like me to put on the backs? Some, so I've got like traditional, funny, um, long-lasting, big, fun to draw. But these kinds of things, the fun to draw and the something I saw recently and a great topic for a game... I want maybe 10 of those. I don't want the entire deck to be quite complicated things. See, um, ideally, I'd like all the descriptions to be mutually compatible. I want some 
I want them to never, but like to, yeah, do potentially like hard to draw, that could be a thing. Oh, hard to eat. That might be a thing. Hard to eat. So like, it's hard to eat, but no, because if it's impossible, if you get impossible to draw and fun to draw, remember you're getting three of the descriptions at once. But I really like um, hard to do something. But anyway, um, so I've been asking and then for topics and so the person said two of the adjectives that they gave were things that I had anyway, which, oh, cute, fluffy. These are good suggestions. I like them. Keep them going and I will write them all down after the show. But as always, hello, Jess. It is lovely to see you. And finally... I want to talk about this other game. Ooh, monstrous. Ooh, monster-like. Yes, I'm going to have to um, definitely compare it to the other 52 to make sure they're all compatible. So this final game was by Bob. Here's Bob. This is Bob and... Bob invented this game apparently in 2013, but didn't do anything about it. The impression I get is that their son said, okay, let's do something with this game. It's a good game. Let's take it long to play test, see what people are saying. And once I told them, it, it, well, Jeremy over there said, oh, maybe have some more decisions, have um, some more objectives, a bit more complexity. And then... Chris on my right said, oh, there's not a lot of choice. There's a lot of luck. And I kind of interrupted him by, because this game is not what any hobbyist would choose to play. This game literally roll the dice and you either place it on the 5 free space or you place it on the 3 5 space. And it's like grid coordinates. So you've at most got a choice of two spaces. If you've already gone in one of the spaces, well, you have to go in the other space. If one of the spaces is empty and one of the spaces is not, you have to go into the other space. If both of the spaces are filled by your opponents, then you get a choice of which of those two spaces you go for. So as you can tell, um, you roll the dice and sometimes you get a choice between two things, sometimes it's a meaningful choice. Sometimes it's a non-meaningful choice. Now, I felt, and I don't want to make this entire show about this game. This entire show is about a larger thing, which is how much choice do you need in a game? How many decisions? How obvious does it need to be whether... How non-obvious does it need to be? Because people who really like strategizing want various decisions, and decisions are in the eye of the beholder. So a podcast called Decision Space suggests that decisions are um, things that could possibly lead to winning, whereas choices are just things that you can do, but they don't necessarily lead to winning. And that's kind of a really vague eye of the polder kind of thing. Like if you play knots and crosses, the first time you're playing, as far as you're concerned, all of these things are decisions because you don't know what's going on. Okay, if there's two in a row, you probably get an idea you have to block that if the two in the row is your opponent's or if it's your own, you still need to go into the same place. But fundamentally, as you get better at the game, you realize, okay, it makes absolutely no difference and knots and crosses perhaps ceases to be interesting for you. But getting back to that thing we said at the start, that every game needs variability. And the game does have variability. You roll the dice and, hey, I won. And sure, I feel like I made a better choice at each junction. I blocked the person who was most likely to win when I had a choice of who to block. I chose things that were likely to lead me to victory. But, hey, I'm sure that if you analysed everything perfectly with a computer, there'd be, like, probably one point where it was like, okay, this one gave you 
49% chance of winning. This one will give you like a 51% chance of winning. Or this one gave you a 27% chance of winning. This one gave you a 26% chance of winning. And he still did a slightly worse move. But it's so incremental. Like, I feel like I feel like I probably played close to perfect because it's not a sim it's not a complex game. It's very simple. But at the same time, there's a story, and that's the important thing. I felt some agency. Sure, it might have been obvious, but I was still the one making the choices to go there and block, to go there and try to connect myself, to play the winning move that won me the game. But sure, it doesn't mean, it doesn't reflect on my intellect, it doesn't reflect on my skill. It reflects largely on the narrative of the game, the story, the fact that it all came together, if you know what I mean. And I think that kind of ties to what people are looking for in games, because people love LCR, left, centre, right. And let me take a quick break to, oh yeah, just to clarify, I told them that as far as I'm concerned, it's just a case of taking it to London Toy Fair or something similar and chasing up the more toyetic people, the Gibsons, the, um, yeah, university games, people who will actually potentially get the game in front of a lot more people and in front of the right audience. Because if you were to give it to um, Space Cowboys, for example, or Yellow, which is a lovely company, or indeed Jigamic. Jigamic does not do that kind of game, and it's about matching your thing to the company. Anyway, let's talk about Brilliant Thing. Brilliant Thing, what's a little thing, which is brilliant. So, two things. Firstly, choices are brilliant because they lead you to feel in control. Choices are good because they make you feel controlled, they make you give a sense of empowerment, they make you feel, oh, I can do this or I can do that. And it's nice to be offered a choice, especially when they're both upside, especially when it's like, oh, I get to do this and I kind of want to do that and I get to do that and I kind of want to do that and I get to choose amazing. That feels that feels good. And sometimes a choice when you feel, oh, I made that choice and I won. You feel a sense of validation. You feel a sense of responsibility for your victory. You feel a sense of involvement. On the other hand, let's talk about the brilliant thing of randomness. Randomness leads to variation. Randomness leads to, oh, I lost, but oh, I'll just blame it on the dice. And that's a, I know that sounds like a really silly thing to say, but randomness leads to us variability to excitement to drama jess says um sometimes choices can be a distraction and i'm not going to go into that political thing although i probably agree with what you're saying but um yeah i'm going to try and keep it more about games before i finish but if you want to comment, ask questions from like follow, do all that stuff, and let's crack on with the main topic. I do actually need to just be 30 seconds. <laughs> oh. All good. Okay. Sorry about that brief interruption. Um now, where was I? Yes. I think that both of these things are brilliant and I think it's important for a lot of designers are hobbyists because frankly you need to make something your hobby before you actually decide that you're going to engage with it at such a level that you're not only playing the games, you're spending time thinking about them and you're designing them. I mean, what kind of weirdo would do something like that in all seriousness? Um, Look, I love, I like playing a long game. I like playing Empire Express or Sidereal Confluence or Dune or like D-Macker. And I've enjoyed a couple of 18xx games. 
but they aren't the most approachable. These aren't always easy games for people to get into. So let's talk about the bad parts of these things. So let's talk about why, obviously, everyone who makes games probably hate, hates randomness. Like, there's almost a strong element of people saying, oh, I want control over everything. And all the Germanic board games where it was, oh, dice are bad. Get rid of the dice. And we're just going to make all the decisions ourselves. And I think there's something nice about that. I'm on board with that. I find it appealing. I love playing an abstract strategy game with two players. I said at the start, I love the think and write game that I played and on Saturday. But a fully random game with no choices at all. And when we play, we might not even play. We just say, this is not a game. And that's not good. Like LCR, a dice game where you roll the dice and then you look at what the dice say. And if it's L, you give something to the left. If it's R, you give something to the right. If it's C, you give something to the center. And eventually you run out of chips and the last person with chips is the winner of the game. And that's basically that. And that's not a game that you make choices within, but it has that agency. It has that variability. It has everyone chose to play it. Everyone could leave at any time. It's an opt-in, opt-out activity. Yeah, it's got the rules. It's got all the aspects of the game. And so it's, you know, frankly, if you want to say, oh, for me, a game means that there has to be some choice. There has to be some decision making. Well, then I guess we're talking about different games. Let's, what, if you disagree with my terminology in your mind, when I say game, replace it with play thing or activity or whatever you want. But the point is that these games do have real value. Snakes and Ladders, to my mind, I think it should be shorter. I think that it would be slightly better if it was maybe 25 spaces, 49, something like that, maybe 36, I don't know. But yeah, just I find that when I play it as a child, I got quite bored. Well, I played it with what, one person, and it's like they got bored before we finished and I never actually finished a game of Snakes and Ladders, which is that an issue? Is it not an issue? It depends on your perspective. But for me, I feel a bit sad about that. I feel like when I'm playing with my nibblings, I would like them to be engaged until the end. I don't want to say, hey, here's a game. It teaches you about, well, I don't tell them that it teaches them about counting and moving stuff and taking turns, that's just going to come around through the playing of the game. But then I start playing and then they get bored. But I think that's a key thing about choice. Choices are interesting. Choices involve us. Choices are, oh, now I'm a bit more engaged. Now I'm feeling even more agency, even if it's as simple as going here or here. I would actually be really interested to know what the strategic game with the fewest possible choices, like an A, B binary choice, could you do that and still make a strategic, meaningfully strategic game that feels rewarding and feels like, yes, I won based on the choices that I made? I'm sure you could, but I'm just wondering if any already exist. Anyway, the point is, as we go back to something like LCR, Snakes and Ladders, Candyland, or indeed Bob's game over here. All of these games, and just to make it clear, Bob's game does occasionally have a choice. It has a choice almost half the time, but it's just one smidgen above those other games that I mentioned. And here's where we get into the key thing. Who will be playing the game? Because Choices are tiring. Choices can make us feel bad when we lose. Randomness can mean that the worst player can win, which is actually a really good thing. 
if you want it to be a family game, if you want it to be a game where someone is about to win, but there's a choice, there's a chance that they might never roll the thing that they need. They might roll the thing that they need and then win, or they might never roll the thing that they need and then you might be able to overtake them somehow because they are constantly rolling the same two numbers. And that would be unfortunate for them, but it would be funny if they were way in the lead and they only needed one space to win and then you got everything of your own sorted out. I Randomness leads to drama. Randomness generates a story. Randomness cushions our ego as players. Randomness gives us something to react to. I mean, there's a lot of arguments that backgammon is a more skillful game than chess or go, because not only do you have to think what your opponent might do, but you have to think what the dice might do. You have to analyze the probabilities. And that's basically it. That's all I've got to say on the topic. Do you have any thoughts on it? What's the least, what's the game with the fewest choices that you've actually enjoyed? Like when I've, I'm going, to, like Yogi, when I think about it, Yogi is a game purely about performance. There are no choices. And also when we look at a um, game like Geister Splits, there are no choices. I guess in theory you could pick up the wrong object or in jungle speed there are no choices it's just you have to pick up the stick when there's a match but if you pick up the stick at any other time it's a foul and I think all those games the key thing that differentiates them is difficulty of operation difficulty of doing the thing so in a speed game it's all about being faster than your opponents so, of course, if you play with super speedy people, then you're going to need to be super, super speedy. Whereas if you play with slow people, you just need to be not slow. And um, whereas in a game where the challenge is in holding your body in a certain position, like Yogi, well, again, the difficulty is in the execution. And I guess I wonder, like, what other types of difficulty of execution would there be? Because there's guessing in games where you listen to things. Um, but again, you're making possible choices. And it almost feels like the, in a sense, if you listen in Mordemarossa to where a little cube tumbled down, and then you listen in to see, okay, which of these floors did it land on? But then... You, you've got the choice of all those floors, but it's basically all about the execution. That feels incredibly similar to a game like Jungle Speed, where you always have the choice to grab the totem. It's just about analyzing. Guessing is maybe a bad word, but it's about that analysis. That, And I guess memory. Memory is also a test. So... Like, if games are about doing something, like, sometimes they are about recognising pictures. Sometimes they can be about the memory or the listening. And in theory, if you do these things perfectly, there is no choice. There are games that are all about analysing choices, analysing the strategy, thinking ahead. Things like 18xx games, games where you're building rail networks or trying to move people around into the perfect spot to get your farm going or games where you're trying to select the best card out of a few to take. I mean, Sushi Go, it's, all, it's a light game, but it's still all about the choices. That's the fundamental crux of Sushi Go. And, but then... You've got the other side where it is, you can't, there's not even the chance of grabbing the thing correctly. There's no rules for a foul. And maybe that's the key thing. Like 
if you grab, in theory, there's, you grab the totem when you're not meant to in jungle speed, well, that's a foul, you take a bunch of cards. But if you drop the cards when you're not meant to in Yogi, well, you're out of the game. In Snakes and Ladders, there's not even that possibility. If you move to the wrong space, that's not even covered by the rules. It assumes you can do the thing. It assumes that everyone can do the thing. And so, yeah, what I guess I'm getting at is that games don't need a lot of choice. Games don't need to be about analysing 10 possibilities and thinking which is the best one or even analysing three possibilities. Sometimes a game can be just about rolling two dice, saying you go here or you go here. You've literally got two spaces where you can go. Sometimes you've only got one space where you can go, but that's okay. Because when there's one space you can go, you're like, well, I'm just chilling. I'm having a good time with my friends. We're talking and we're discussing other things that aren't necessarily the game. And when there's two choices, sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes I want to link my color. Sometimes I want to block someone else's color. Sometimes one person's about to win and the other person's not. But sometimes it needs like 10, 20 seconds of consideration. And having that be not there all the time is actually a really interesting design choice. And the more I think about it, the more I actually appreciate Bob's game. And the more I think, you know what? That was a good game, Bob. And I do hope that I will be very interested to see what happens with it. Anyway, that's been a vague blether. As usual with these sorts of things, it's not meant to be... I'm not trying to pretend I'm any sort of authority. I know a lot of games. I spent a lot of hours thinking about games. and But this is not by any means my f final thoughts let alone anyone's final thoughts on the matter but i'm just basically saying choices matter randomness matters and you can have a game with no randomness but in the realm of games with some choice and a lot of randomness i mean you've got lots of games with zero choice essentially but when it comes to two choices how many games are there that do that and i can't think of any off the top of my head so yeah i think this is a really interesting design space yeah and it's not for everyone but there's definitely definitely a market Anyway, and also, fundamentally, it's not about a game needs variability. Whether that variability comes about by player choice or by randomness, you need variability in a game is the key thing that I decided. Okay, question of the day, question of the day. I'll ask you a little question before we go on our way. And so if you are watching this live or if you're watching this after the fact, whether you're watching on Twitter or YouTube or Facebook or whatever, I am interested to know what is, again, what is the game that you enjoy or what games do you enjoy that have zero choice or at least the least choice that you can imagine? The games that I can think of, again, are the speed games, Geister Splits, Jungle Speed, Grapple, Wibble, I mean, I guess there's a choice of, but these are games purely about the difficulty of execution, and that's really interesting. But when we get to a game with the fewest choices, as in more than one option, I guess 
again, like I come to a game about quickly grabbing creatures, that's our totally different, and counting your turnips, because you've got to choose when to take your vegetables. Do you take it right now or do you take it later? Um, yeah, I can't think of anything, really. I'm struggling to... I'm going to say... Do, 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 do. Sushi go? I mean, that's not... That's still quite a lot of choices, but you basically get seven, six, five, four, three, two choices. So that's an average of about three and a half choices each time. You do have a lot to think about, but yeah, I'm going to say Sushi Go is the game that I really like, that has the fewest choices that I can think of. That is the game. Um. Yeah, now over to you. What are you up to? You can share, but only if you want to. Something you're looking forward to, something you need to do, hopes, ambitions, something about your situation, fun and frivolous or super serious, whatever it is. I am personally hoping to go for a quick bike ride down to Clapham Junction. I'm going to have a quick bit of brunch, um, grab a pizza, get myself down there, meet someone who might be helping me at Aircon, and then come back in time for an interview with Who, What, Why. I'm quite excited to chat to them. And yeah, that is pretty much my day. I might do a wee bit of chatting with Lila, but that is my day. Let's recap and wrap up before we finish up. So to summarise, games need four things, not just three. Games need rule. Rules that you decide before the game starts, to my mind. I mean, there can be other rules as well, but you need some rules that you decide before the game starts. They need to have the freedom to choose. you choose to play and you can choose to stop playing. It's not something you're beholden to. It's not slavery. It's not work. It's not something that someone forces you into. It's something that you choose to start. And I know there's a social construct, like if you stopped playing every game that you started halfway through, eventually people would get annoyed, but there has to be that option. Thirdly, there needs to be agency. I'm not saying there needs to be strategy, I'm saying some sort of agency. Even the picking up of a die and rolling it is agency. A role-playing game talking about what your character does is certainly agency and then the fourth thing is variability and that variability can come from player input it can come from how the cards are shuffled the order in which they come it can come in a zero chance game like chess down to the choices that the people make but you need that variability is the key thing that i've realized today the other thing that i've realized is that there's not that many games where you just get a choice of these are three possible things you can do and sure, in Ticket to Ride, it's like, okay, you pick up cards, or you pick up tickets, or you play track. But within each of those, there's a lot of options. Like if you pick up cards, you could pick up one of five, and then you pick up another one of those five. So like there's 25 options in theory, like also off the top of the deck, just within that one thing. Whereas when it's, okay, pick up this, or pick up this, or pick up this, and yeah, Sushi Go is the closest I can think to having really few options, and yeah, I'm interested to know about more, and um, I do think that as designers, we overestimate the number of options that people need. As designers, we, and hobbyists, we underestimate the joy of abnegation, the joy of a story that gets told not just because of the decisions of the people around, but also because of the random chance. Yeah, I just think that's worth bearing in mind. I am Stuffed by Bears. Check me out everywhere. Stuffedbybears.com. Twitter.com slash Stuffed by Bears. Instagram.com slash Stuffed by Bears. All those places. Stuffedbybears.com slash streams if you want to check out what I'm streaming about tomorrow. Tomorrow I am chatting to Rob Fisher about brute forcing the possibility space for puzzle games. And then 
Wednesday, I'm chatting to Alan Paul. And Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I might be at Bastion. I'm not sure. So, yes. That, and in a few, wow. Just looking at my calendar, it's pretty full on and there's only two weeks to aircon. But yes, please share, spread the word. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, for everyone, for popping in. Lots of love. And for now, the only thing left to say is, as always, bye, 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 bye. This is the goodbye song. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you for watching along. Bye, 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 bye. This is the end of the show. Bye, bye. Bye bye, and now it's time to go to do bye 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 bye. This is goodbye song. Bye 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 bye. Thank you for watching long. Bye 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 bye. This is the end of the show. Bye 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 bye, and now it's time to go. Bye bye.